Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Good morning, good morning. It is Sunday. That means it is college football recap for week number 10. This is Winning Cures Everything. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. Ooh, and this was not the best week of college football, but it was at least entertaining, right? That's right. So we had a fantastic scene in the Bluff City, in the city of Memphis, the beautiful land in the world. It was so great, so great. College game day down on Beale Street. We had the big game of the evening at the Liberty Bowl. It was uh, it was definitely a good time, but we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about Georgia, Florida. We'll talk about the Pac-12 playoff hopes with Oregon and Utah winning last night. All of that good stuff to come on the show. The show, of course, brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They have got six incredible sports books, and you can find more information over at tunicatravel.com. They've got all the stuff that's going on with Tunica right there on the website, all their sports books, along with everything else that's going on. they got good golf courses down there. they got... Just fun stuff to go do. I mean, they got the Top Golf Swing Suite over at the Horseshoe. They got, uh, not the Horseshoe, at the Gold Strike. They got it, it, just a ton of fantastic stuff for you to go and check out. So go to tunicatravel.com, do yourself a favor, and figure it out. Find a way to get down there. It is a damn good time. You can find us over at winningcureseverything.com. All of our picks, previews. The picks were not great last night, by the way. Whew, you and I. Things haven't been great all year. No, they haven't been great all year. But, man, I was I was hoping once we get into November, maybe we'd turn something around and things just are not going the way that I would anticipate. But that's all right. We're yeah. going to keep it going. One of these weeks, we're going to have a really good week, and it'll all be worth it, right? It'll all be worth it. Sure. So, <laughs> but you can find all of that along with all of our picks, our previews, our football pick em contest, which is currently going on for this week. Uh, you win great prizes from Tunica Travel. All sorts of stuff over on the website, our social media platforms. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. You can find all of that over at winningcureseverything.com. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Leave us some comments. Share the show out. Hit the like button. Like these videos. Tell everybody you know about it, man. We would appreciate that. And if you're on the podcast, make sure you leave a nice review if you're on Apple Podcasts. Otherwise, just just click the rating thing. Whatever it is. If you're on Overcast, I think it's uh, it's you like the podcast or something like that, whatever it is. But absolutely help us out with that. Those things help more than you know. It helps out with the, the analytics and the algorithms and whatever all the fancy words are. Go help us out with that. If you're on Apple Podcasts, like I said, five-star review. Leave a written review. We'll read it on the show when we record on Tuesday night for the picks and previews. So, Chris, let's, uh, let's go ahead and fire in on topic number one. It was a fantastic day. In the Bluff City. I went down to college game day, went and checked it out. It was an insane scene, right? Just everything about it was interesting and beautiful. And to see all of those people for a group of five school in such incredible sight lines. It, like, you you stayed home and watched it on TV so you could see that side of it. Tell me what you saw from from the television side. How did it look to the rest of the country? Man, I thought, I thought it was awesome. I mean, it, it looked really good. Uh, going straight down Bill Street, place was packed. Every avenue was packed. Every bar, every restaurant was packed, and you could see it. The the, the crowd, Memphis showed up, and this is what we wanted to see. And and I've said this for a long time, and I think ESPN coming to more of these American schools like this, if they begin to do this, they realize how good of an atmosphere it is. Then then we will change the narrative we will change the language in which we use to describe these schools and no longer a group of fives that the american is without question separated itself from the other group of five conferences and they are top to bottom better than some every year they have been better than at least one power five conference we have to either consider them a power six conference or we need to bounce somebody who's not consistent. No, I, I agree. If you look at the ratings, you look at S&P Plus, or SP Plus, whatever it's called now, Bill Conley over at ESPN. If you look at those ratings, if you were to drop UConn, which they will next year, you oh, drop really? UConn out, and if you took Clemson away from the ACC, oh, the AAC cow. is, yeah, the AAC is better than the ACC 
in, in every metric. Not so close. It, it's it's pretty remarkable. And and of course the back of course every year you've got top heavy conferences. We get that right. The SEC is top heavy. The Pac twelve right. this year is top heavy. The Big Twelve is pretty top heavy. Now the Big Twelve, of course, I mean that's everybody just beats everybody in the Big Twelve. The, the, the Big Ten is top heavy. Yeah, the Big Ten is definitely top heavy. They've now, got the some. Pac-12, uh, I don't think the Pac twelve is top heavy at all. I think the Pac twelve, the separation between number one team and and number seven team is not a lot. No, I I agree with you. I agree. Let, let's say USC is the number seven team, though. I mean, Oregon demolished them last night, and we'll talk about that. But, but there are, there are times. It's one game and. Yeah, Washington State almost got them last week. Hang on, if Utah ends up being the best team in that conference, USC beat them, and they're yeah. the number seventeen. So yeah, I mean that's I, I'm with you. I'm with you. But at, as far as Memphis goes, it was a fantastic scene. The yeah. AAC definitely showed out. Uh, it, it, when you go to these big cities, these major cities, game day looks good. And like imagine game day at Cincinnati. Imagine game day not on campus at Houston, but just in downtown Houston. Imagine, yes. you know, it, and, and yes, Memphis they, is a little bit different. They've done it from Orlando, and it's been incredible. Yeah, imagine. UCF showed up. Oh, yeah, and UCF was on campus, right? Like, that yeah. was a big deal. Memphis, it's a little bit different of a situation because Memphis, the whole city, rallies around that one university, that one school. Well, we're not, we're commuter school. Yeah, it, it, it's easier that way. And, and I think Cincinnati is somewhat the same. Oh, I, oh yeah. You know, yeah. I, a lot we're of these schools. We're downtown, though, by the way. Like, yeah. If they ever go to Georgia Tech, they need to be in down. They have before. They need to be in downtown Atlanta because Georgia Tech is a commuter school. Yeah, Campus, the way they play, place they locate, like like it's just not. When you're in a big city, you don't have this massive campus like you do in these small rural towns that are built around the college. No, you're you're right about and, that. And that's that's fifty percent or more of the America. Yes, yes, it absolutely is. When it goes to Navy. It's incredible. I'm telling you. Yeah. The American Conference is Tulane. One day they're going to get to Tulane and they're going to be on Bourbon Street. They're going to be downtown. Maybe not on Bourbon Street. No, they'll there. they'll do Jackson Square. Yeah, they'll, they'll be downtown, <laughs> and and it's going to be incredible. And yes. we got to start taking these teams serious. Yes, we we most certainly do. Let's talk about the game itself. Come on. Memphis 54, SMU 48. Now this was a 54 to 32 game. Midway through the fourth quarter, SMU scores a couple of late touchdowns to make it close. They've got an onside kick. Uh, everybody wants to talk. First, let's talk about the two-point conversion try at the end. Now, okay. more and more coaches are doing this, and Kirk was surprised at it. But you and I have talked about this several times already this year. Coaches are beginning to understand the analytics of this, right? It makes way more sense to go ahead and try because from the three-yard line, it is a 50-50 shot that you actually get a two-point conversion. And if you feel good about your play calling, then you may as well take the shot the first time because if you don't get it that time, odds are you will get it the second time. But if you get it the first time, you can just kick the extra point and win the game on the next one. So if you're already behind and you're in desperation mode anyway, it makes perfect sense, right? And also, if you miss it, guess what? You go for it the next time, and you're in the exact same spot. Exactly. So if it's a 50-50 split, whether or not you get it, that it, it all makes sense when you're looking at the numbers. If you're not looking at the numbers, you know, it is what it is. You can also have a kicker like Tulsa had last week that shanks a 29-yarder. You know, it a 20-yard field goal should be easy. But if you don't trust your kicker, it makes even more sense, right? And SMU, from what I understand, does not necessarily trust their kicker. So this, it was perfectly fine. I don't think there was anything crazy about it. The closing line was Memphis minus six and a half. A lot of people were thinking, oh, Sonny Dyke is trying to, to cover that spread. I don't think that was it at all. I don't think he was worried about that at that point. I think the analytics show this is the right play. Yeah. No, because they absolutely I do, do. Believe, I do believe that the analytics show that you get the two-point conversion about 50% of the time. Well, if you get it 50% of the time, this is absolutely the right play because then the extra point is to win the game. If you shake the extra point, then you you still tied going to overtime. And if you miss it, then you got to hit the other field uh, coin flip. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. So the big story of the game, Antonio Gibson from Memphis. He has not had a whole lot of, uh, of run this year, at least not uh, uh, the hype, right? He hasn't had the hype this year. But 
396 all-purpose yards last night. He had a kickoff return touchdown. He had a long receiving touchdown. He had a long rushing touchdown. The guy was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So that is somebody to pay attention to. Everybody was talking about Kenneth Gainwell. Look, Memphis has got guys like this all over the team. Like, they can, every position they can score from. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, Memphis leads all of FBS with 10 kickoff return touchdowns since 2016. They are explosive. And you knew that that was going to be a big part of this game because SMU was susceptible to that. If you look at special teams, Memphis, I believe, was ranked number five in the country as far as the uh, S&P Plus uh, uh, special teams metrics, right? Number five in the country. SMU, number 111. And that played out big in this ballgame. So the one touchdown that Memphis got on a kickoff return, that was the difference in the ballgame. So that makes a big difference. There were zero turnovers by either team in this. I was really surprised because I am so used to Memphis giving the other team more chances. And had they done that here, that would have been a problem. That would have been a major league problem. Um, quarterback play, pretty good. That This was a lot of fun for a national audience to be able to watch. Brady White, 19 out of 33 for 360 yards and three touchdowns. Shane Bouchelle, 34 out of 54, 456 yards and three touchdowns. Total offense for both teams, 1,067 yards. Now, for a primetime TV audience, that is a lot of fun to watch. That's just insane. Yeah. It was, it was ping pong. It was back and forth. And, it, you know, if you're coming in and watching two teams that you don't normally watch, you want to be able to see explosive plays. You want to see them moving up and down the field. And they definitely provided that last night. Memphis looked great. I wish the defense could get some stops because they, they should have won this one by double, you know, double digits. But, uh, but they get the win. And I think with all of the hype and everything surrounding them, I think this will move them up the polls. I think you'll be surprised where they will land when the CFP uh, rankings come out on Tuesday night. Let's, uh, let's move into what, what really was the, the biggest game as far as national implications, right? National title implications. Next up, uh, Georgia and Florida. Now, did you watch all of this game? I watched a whole lot of it. I went back late, late last night after the uh, the Nate Diaz-Jorge Masvidal fight and watched, you know, a, a lot of highlights and whatnot, and I tried to fast-forward through a bunch of stuff because I had the game recorded. I watched the whole first half, and Georgia pretty much dominated that first Dominate. half. They dominated the whole game. Yeah, and that's, that's what I was going to say. It felt like they dominated everything. That first drive that Florida had, when they had that fourth and one, and they drive down to the, the Georgia 40, they get fourth and one, and rather than try and run, because you, you should feel like your offensive line has enough willpower to get a, a first down on fourth and really less than one. That, that's when I knew I was in trouble when they threw that ball. They threw a pass on fourth and one at the 40, and I just I, I was dumbfounded. Yep. My jaw dropped. I didn't know what they were doing. So this was another pretty clean game. You know, no turnovers for either team, so there wasn't an advantage there. But I, I got to tell you, Georgia with Lawrence Cager in there at wide receiver is a different football team. He is He's their only threat. I, while I agree that he is a stud and he had a hell of a day, Fromm looked amazing, you, you might have been dead on with this whole thing. And Kirby Smart might have been sandbagging all this. I don't know. He took the, he took the reins off of the offense. Today. Well, I think I'll, I'll tell you this. I think that has to do with Cager. And, and the reason I say that, Cager has been out since the second half of the South Carolina game. And he, he's had that shoulder problem. He was probable for this game. And I think that him being their only legitimate deep threat, the only one that Fromm feels comfortable with, I think that had something to do with it. Because, that, you know, we didn't know necessarily that he was going to play in this ball game, But with him in there, this is a different Georgia offense. I mean, it, it, you could tell it in this ballgame. Yeah, Florida had no real answers for anything. They couldn't stop the run. They couldn't stop the pass. It, it looked like Florida felt like they were going to come in here and win this game, and they didn't prepare at all, yeah, which it's, is rare for a Dan Mullins team in a big rivalry game to just not show up. Yeah. They, they didn't show up at all, and Georgia took it to them. Took it to them. Yeah, they certainly did. Dan, Dan is an offensive guy. 
and Dan knows how to put together an offense to compete with and hang with anybody in the country. And I don't know what the hell they were doing. I just don't. I don't know. Georgia blew them up. They had 20-something yards rushing yesterday. 20. They, they couldn't break 30 yards rushing. Are you kidding me, Dan? Yeah. What the hell is going on? I know Georgia's defense is stout. Look, don't get me wrong. But, but I've watched several other teams – Move the ball on Georgia before. Okay, this yeah. is this is not you know one of the greatest defenses we've ever seen. I don't know what the hell is going on in Florida. Well, Georgia did. I mean, they they've got some big old defensive linemen. I get that. So it it is tough to run on them. But it was it was a really it was just a weird game plan. Like, and I, you you know that they had to have a game plan. But when something goes south, normally. Dan is able to make adjustments, right? Mullen can make that's, adjustments with the best of them. That's what I was expecting in this game. And he and yes, they did score, you know, 14 points after halftime. But by that point the game was done. I was say it didn't matter by then. It didn't I matter. Mean, it this was 20 to 3 at one point. Like I I just I don't know. Or no, it was uh, what 16 to 3, I think. Yeah, I was going to say what? 16 to 3. Yeah. Yeah, it it was interesting. To say the least, but Georgia wins twenty-four to seventeen. They take the lead in the SEC East. They uh, they they look like they might be they the walk to Atlanta. Yeah, and and they look like they will probably be the top-ranked one-loss team uh, when we get to the college football playoff selection. So I mean, we we, we got a long way to go for that. Oh, I agree. But as far as the rankings go on Tuesday night, like oh, you're talking about Tuesday? Wait, yeah. Wait, okay. We yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the rankings, the rank, not the selection. Sorry, the rankings. I was about to say, come on now, you're for that to happen, they have to win the SEC title, and no. they got to beat Georgia. Like, what? Hang on, we're just chalking those up to W's. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just talking about right now, right now for this week. So I would All imagine right. they will be, uh, they'll be the top ranked one loss team, and then we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Next up, Pac-12 playoff hopes. Let's talk about a couple of other one loss teams. Utah goes into Washington. And pretty much dominates that game, thirty-three oh, to twenty-eight. You didn't watch any of that game. You didn't watch any of that game. You think they dominated the game? They were down ten to nothing at one point. Or no, fourteen to uh, fourteen to three. Sorry, they were down fourteen to three. Oregon was down ten to nothing, uh, and then dom- they outscored them thirty to seven. You know, for the rest of the way until there was a minute left. So, it, tell me what I'm missing here. Did you watch any of it? Yeah, I watched a whole lot of it, man. I went right. back and forth. This was the game I was watching with the Georgia game. So go back and forth on this game. Right. And well, and. This was a close, tight game. They got a couple of turnovers. Well, of course, Washington got several turnovers early. They just couldn't score on them. Yeah. And Utah got some turnovers. Got the ball back. They they did score, but but it wasn't it wasn't in a dominating fashion. It was just one of those things where it was. It, I felt like this was a lot like the Baylor Oklahoma State game in the sense of the score makes it look a little lopsided. But if you watch that game, it was close. It was real close, and then all of a sudden. One team made a mistake, the other team capitalized. Then they made another mistake, the other team capitalized. Then, then it's ball game. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I know I, that's Washington, the way I felt when watching this game. Washington was outscored thirty to seven from the time that they went up fourteen to three in this game, and and they scored a touchdown with a minute left when the game was pretty much decided. Right. So it it may be not dominating, but I mean Utah did hold them to only fifty three rushing yards for the entire game. That's that's pretty dominant when that when you look at stats. Yeah, but like Washington that. Just doesn't run the football. If you if you watch yeah. their offense, their running game is short passing game. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Let's uh let's talk about Oregon. Oregon talked uh, talked to USC into giving them the football four times, and that was pretty much all she wrote. USC went up ten to nothing, and they were outscored fifty six to fourteen the rest of the way. It was uh it, it was pretty bad, pretty bad in the Coliseum. Everybody exited early. Uh, I mean, U- USC, they have talent, but, man, Oregon was ready for this game. I-, I told you last week, Oregon and Washington State, that was a look-ahead spot for Oregon because USC, regardless of record, is still the bell cow, right? That's that's still who everybody wants to go beat, especially in L.A., and Oregon absolutely showed out in this game. They looked great. I went back and watched a lot of this one. I hadn't gotten to watch the Utah one, but I did watch a lot of this one. And that, I mean, I, I feel good about Oregon right now. They they look fantastic. No, Oregon looks great. We, we're going to disagree on USC being the bell cow. They're, they're, they're it in name only. That is it. 
That's they that's all I'm talking about. But this is what happens when you bully when you bully a conference for as long as you bu- they bully the conference that and and you fall from grace. Nobody is going to take it easy on you. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you. People are going to come for blood, and they're going to beat the hell out of you when they can. Yes, and they absolutely did that. Absolutely. And that's just, that's just going to happen. If Clemson ever falls back to where they were, you know, 12 years ago, if the ACC can ever muster any type of pride to get better, <laughs> then that's going to happen. Oklahoma ever falls from grace, it's going to happen. It happened when Texas fell from grace. Oh, yeah. Like, the reason all those coaches kept getting run through there is because they weren't able to be dominant and other teams said, oh, you're weak and you beat the hell out of us forever and you acted like you were better than us forever. It's going to happen. If Alabama ever falls from grace or Ohio yep. State, people are going to get their rocks off for a decade on beating the hell out of you. Uh, it, remember, that's what happened with Alabama when, they, yeah, right. when Stallings left. I mean, it's just it, when you when you fall even a little bit, everybody takes advantage, and it looks way worse than it should. It, it all, and it, and it's, yeah, and it's really hard to bounce back from that. And when you do bounce, you gotta you, you can't slow down. You just can't slow down. It's why what is happening in Ohio State and what's happening in Oklahoma are so important that they don't they didn't they had a plan for when the legend leaves. Yeah. To, to hand the ball off to a successor and not bring somebody new in and try to start from scratch. Because starting from scratch from that, it's not it's not the idea of following a legend that's so hard. It's the idea of we've been the best program in our conference for so long. If if we take even a little step back, everybody is going to come. Yeah. And and and, and it's gonna be rough. Yeah. No, you're you're a hundred percent right about that. So it's it's terrifying when you look at what is going on with Alabama, um, yeah. because there there is no real succession plan for Nick Saban. You know, it's it, well, no, he's different. He's different than these guys yeah. because those guys built and developed a relationship with assistants, and and I think Nick is a meat grinder, man. I think he just grinds them up, and they just they leave for. What I told you was a red flag this year was it's not that he turns over so many assistants because great coaches do that. It's he turns them over for lateral jobs. When they are willing to leave to be the OC or the DC somewhere else, that that is not a good sign. Yeah. No, that that definitely makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Let's, uh, Let's move on. Let's talk about Notre Dame. Now, I did watch a good portion of this game. Uh, Justin Fuente, like, has got it looking pretty good. The biggest issue here, though, is this game was closer than maybe it should have been. Notre Dame wins it 21-20. to Ian Book, seven-yard touchdown run with 29 seconds left for a one-point win in this game. Uh, you think it was closer than it should have been? Well, Notre Dame had three turnovers. They were all costly. It was unbelievable. Um they outgained Virginia Tech 442 to 240. And I just, it, the turnaround that Virginia Tech has had, like they they understand. I think Fuente gets, okay, I don't have the quarterback yet, oh. but our defense is starting to figure some stuff out. And we can find ways to stay close in ballgames. And if I'm in the game with a few minutes left, we got a shot. It, 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 against bigger teams, against, you know, good teams, whatever, it's keep everything close, and we'll find a way if we can. Like, I, they are now sitting at 5-3, and three, and they had a blowout loss to Duke and a one-point uh, one loss to Notre Dame, and uh, who was the other one, too? I forget. They, they beat Miami. They beat uh, – who? either way – they have won some games they were not supposed to win. And I think that this is a, a positive step. Even if they got outgained like they did by 200 yards. This was a positive step for Virginia Tech. Now, I don't know what it says about Notre Dame. Other than we saw what they looked like last week against Michigan. But Virginia Tech is not Michigan. Notre Dame should have won this ball game, and, and they did. But by the skin of their teeth. I mean, just unbelievable. Like, what, what, what did you see in this game? Yeah, I mean, so first off, 
have a cell phone back a little bit. So we, we get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an excuse, which I hate excuses. We got to pick our gambling picks. Tuesday, yeah. by Tuesday. The lines have only been out for a day, and we're just trying to figure these things out. So by, by Saturday, you know, I make a lot of picks. Like, I bet a lot of things. Yeah. The early morning slate, I made three bets. Two of them underdogs, bet, bet them to win outright and the spread, went 3-0. and oh. hit, And hit all money lines, so basically 5-0. and oh. Feeling yeah. myself. Thought. Things are looking good. Fuente's a Memphis boy. It's been a great morning for Memphis. I'm, I'm, I'm taking Virginia Tech and the money line. And I got a pretty good price on the money line. Because, I mean, I think it was like plus. I had to go back and find the ticket uh, on my phone. It was plus 180. Plus, I mean, I'm not 180. Plus, like. Like uh, six six eighty. I mean, it was big. It was. Yeah. It was. Big. It may have been bigger than that because I remember uh, this was an eighteen point spread. Yeah, I know it was only an eighteen point. It was only like plus six something though. Okay. Okay. But it's still like plus. Let's just say it was six six hundred, which I know is more than that. Um, I'm thinking, I, I got a shot. I at one point in time I thought that thing was one. Yeah. Because Notre Dame just kind of they looked a little bit like in the Michigan game, man. I think if you hit this team in the face, they quit. Which is yeah. weird because they didn't quit at Georgia, but they never really got hit in the face at Georgia. They they were kind of playing with the lead from Georgia. Georgia had to come back on them. Yeah, you're right about that. But I think when they get down, you hit them in the face, and I, I think they, they fold. And I like the Notre Dame team. I've said it before. This might be Brian Kelly's best team. But, man, I, I think that now they showed some resilience by not quitting. And Ian Book, and Ian Book's a dude. I don't know what year that kid is. He's not coming out after this year, right? Uh, I think he's a junior, isn't he? So, let, let me tell you this. Every year, there's some quarterback that played great in college and doesn't show up at the combine, doesn't get the accolades that everybody else gets. You're talking about Gardner Minshew's this year, a couple of years ago. It's been other guys. And, you know, Dak Prescott was one of like – and they always go – later than expected, and nobody's really thinking about them when they get drafted. You just assume they're going to be a backup. And then they end up being a star. Yeah, I could easily see Ian Book getting drafted third, fourth, fifth, sixth round somewhere, or maybe going undrafted. With, with Notre Dame pedigree, he'll probably get drafted somewhere. Book and, is a, and, Book's a senior, so he's gone. Oh, you know, yeah. Then, and, and him taking over a franchise – for a quarterback that got hurt and never given it back. Yeah. No, I could I could hundred percent see that. In a in a in a draft class that's gonna be massive for quarterbacks, I it wouldn't surprise me in five years if Ian Book is the best quarterback standing. I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. I don't, I don't think so. I think that kid's got Moxie. He's got all the talent in the world. He's got he can make every throw and he looks to have the head on his shoulders. I, I don't know why they tend to fold some – I say fold, they only lost one of these games. But just, like, why they kind of fall apart. In, when, in some big-time spots, right? When they go bad. I mean, it could be a team thing more than a him thing, so. Yeah, I don't I don't, I don't, don't blame that Michigan loss on him. That's, no, I don't either. Oh, Jesus, no. Yeah, no, that, that wasn't on him. Um, I mean, he's a stud. You're right. So, at Notre Dame, like, Brian Kelly has done a good job with that team. They, oh, they've got talent, but – they just don't have as much talent as some of the big dogs, right? And I think Michigan is a big dog. Yeah, and you're talking about, yes, you're talking about the best programs in the country, and Michigan has obviously turned a corner. If you're judging Michigan based off the Army game or the Wisconsin game and backwards, then 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 I don't know what to tell you. Like, yeah. we can't have a rational conversation about what what college football really is. Yeah, it's, it's about development. And that's yeah. it. teams get better, and also teams get worse. Yeah. No, 100%. 100%. Let's, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about Thursday night. We got two games on Thursday night. First off, Georgia Southern 24, App State 21. This was at App State. App State was undefeated, ranked way up there in the AP top 25, whatever, and, and would have been high because of, their, um, because of their P5 win over North Carolina. They would have been higher in the CFP rankings. And yet, they are at home on a short week. And this will tell you to never underestimate having to prep for a triple option offense, even if you see it all the time, right? Never 
underestimate having to prep on a short week for the triple option. Like, this was a Thursday night game at home. App State has been a covering machine. I was, you look back, these games are never close. Like, I've read the stats on our gambling picks last week. They're never close. And yet, for whatever reason, and really this one shouldn't have been close because Georgia Southern absolutely whipped their rear end all game. They are up 24 to 7 going into the fourth quarter. And I was just flummoxed. I didn't know what to do. This is why I tell you all the time all those stats from years past don't matter. They just don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I just, it, it, it blew me away. Blew me away. So App State scores 14 points in the fourth quarter. Now, we'll bring up something that we talked about in our uh, in our group chat. I, when a, when a favorite that I have bet on is, is getting hammered, I cannot stand for them to have a chance at a comeback. I want them to get beat. Like, it, it, when it goes poorly, I want them to get beat as badly as possible. So I was hoping for Georgia Southern to beat these guys by 40 once it got into about midway through the third quarter. When you made that comment, and and my guy Scuzz took that shot at you, I it made my heart warm. I'd have drove to Cincinnati just to give that man a hug. <laughs> he said, he said, so so you feel the same way about those two Alabama wins over Georgia? And I said, yeah, a hundred percent. I enjoyed the wins. Won those damn games. But but the issue there was Alabama was not a big favorite in those games, and I didn't bet on them. So like well, a big favorite. I mean, they were a big enough favorite. They they weren't a fifteen to seventeen point you know home okay. favorite. No, like a, those those kind of games are are a little bit different, right? So yes, I get where he's coming from, and yes, it was a very funny comment. I do appreciate like, him throwing that back out there. I thought about it, but I was like, man, I take enough Alabama shots. I'm gonna leave this one alone. And this guy said, I'll pick it up. I'll yeah. pick it up. He most certainly did. But yeah, oh I was so fired up about this ball game. But App State, that's uh, that's pretty much all she wrote for the uh, the New Year's Six and whatnot. Their strength of schedule is just not strong enough. They don't have enough big wins. Uh, North Carolina has got five losses. We'll talk about them here in a little bit. Say, they needed North Carolina for them to have a marquee win, even though it's a it's a power five win, which I hate saying. Um, they they needed North Carolina to to kind of get hot. Yeah, and and they've also got South Carolina coming up, but. They beat South Carolina. South Carolina's probably not going to a bowl game. So your two marquee wins are not going to be bowl teams from the P, uh, P5, P6, whatever. <laughs> so that's that's definitely not good for them. Next up on Thursday night, you and I, I think, both watched a, a good portion of this game. I had this and App State both on after we got done trick-or-treating, which was relatively early. Let's, uh, let's talk about Baylor 17, West Virginia 14. What did you make of this? I mean, this is just one of those things where when you're undefeated this late in the season, everybody's coming for you. Yeah. Everybody's coming for you. Baylor is beat up on defense and, uh, and, 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 you know, they're, they're trying to get guys healthy and they're trying to, to, you know, play within themselves with the guys that they have out there and, and they're doing their best and everybody is coming to give you their best shot. Wake Forest, and we need to remember this now. Wake Forest is a different team today than they were week one, week two, week three. Yeah. Neil Brown is a hell of a coach. We all agree with that. And it's going to take a little while to get Wake, uh, West, West Virginia. Did I say Wake Forest? Yeah, you West did. Virginia going. <laughs> <clears throat> it's no, going right. to take a little while because Holgerson spent, I don't know, his entire career at West Virginia never developing a defense whatsoever. And – and so Neil's offense is going to be a little bit different, and he's got to try to limit his defensive snaps, and, and that's just tough sometimes. They went into Waco. They gave them all they wanted. Yeah. But Which was, great teams crazy. find a way to win in the middle of adversity. In the middle of adversity, Charlie Brewer is still a dude. Yeah, every great team has to survive a crap performance at some point in the season, right? And this was, and it's not that Baylor played like crap, but. You know, Baylor had three turnovers. West Virginia had two. Baylor outgained West Virginia 453 to 219. And West Virginia only had 14 yards rushing on 26 attempts. I mean, it was just crazy. And and still, even with all of those numbers, 
Baylor had to block a 48-yard field goal with three minutes and 33 seconds left in order to preserve the win. Like, it, sometimes games just go a little wonky, and you got to be able to get out of there with the win. Sure. And, yeah, they, they absolutely did that. Um, let's move on really quick. Oklahoma State 34, TCU 27. Man, I was hoping you had this game on your list. Oh, I most certainly did because, uh, one, I bet Oklahoma State – and then thought, well, that bet's done as soon as I saw the, the Tylen Wallace news, right? I told you. But, don't, but no, count out. don't count the rattlesnake out. No Tylen Wallace, no problem, right? Here's, here's what they ended up doing. Oklahoma uh, State no. had 158 yards passing and 301 yards rushing against that TCU defense. Gary Patterson gave up 300 yards rushing to Oklahoma State. Chuba Hubbard, 20 carries, 223 yards, two touchdowns. Spencer Sanders had 19 carries and 88 yards, but here's the biggest thing, and we talked about this before the season started, and we talked about it again in the middle of the, I guess in the one-third mark of the season, TCU four turnovers, Oklahoma State one turnover, and that's the difference in the ballgame. Yeah, Gary Patterson is going to continue to struggle if he can't find guys that can hold on the ball, and I'm guessing this is just the best guys he's got. And so that's the reason they keep getting run out there. But but you you say that's the biggest thing because that probably is the biggest thing when it comes to the outcome of the score. Chuba Hubbard, 223 yards. That's the biggest thing. On 20 touches, that is 11-plus yards a carry, baby. That's insane. <laughs> Hang on. He, is, he has separated himself from the second highest rusher in the league by over 300. Hundred yards. Oh, and it's going to get more crazy. He he is an absolute stud. You told me you were worried when Washington went down. I said, don't be worried. Don't be worried. Because Mike Gundy made – this is not a knock on Washington. I promise it's not. Oh, Mike, oh, Wallace. Mike Gundy made Washington. He's going to make somebody else. He, That's what he does. <laughs> Every year, some big receiver comes out of Oklahoma State. They go into the NFL. It's about a 50-50 shot if they're great or not. And then somebody else becomes that next big receiver. Yeah, no, you're right. Mike, Mike, what Mike Gundy does to receivers is, is, is what some of these other, I don't know, like, it, it's what Lincoln Riley's doing with quarterbacks. Yeah, no, he's you're, you're 100% right. It's credit because we just don't think of receivers that way. And I don't know that he's ever had a running back this good in his life. Oh, it, he's, he's something else. He is something else. Let's stay in the Big 12. Let's move on. Kansas State 38. Oh. Yeah, uh, Kansas 10. Kansas State had 342 rushing yards. Kansas only had 61. Uh, Kansas had two turnovers. Kansas State, zero turnovers. Kansas didn't score a touchdown until there were 35 seconds left in the game. This was never in doubt. Uh, this was a dominating performance. Chris Kleiman is doing some fantastic well, Chris stuff. Chris Kleiman's great. So I think, I think Kansas absolutely ran out of gas here. Yeah. I went back and looked when I saw this just boat whipping happening. And, and I thought Kansas played Oklahoma to the break. They played Texas as close as you can play a team and not win. Yep. And then they pulled out the win against Texas Tech. And then they got a rivalry game of Kansas State coming in who's hot. I thought Kansas State would have the letdown emotionally because they had the bigger win. But those three games back to back to back, back to back to back for a team like Kansas State, <laughs> probably just doesn't have the talent that most of these Power 5 schools have. They're just not physically able to show up and fight four weeks in a row like that. Yeah. No, you're you're 100% I, right there. That, and that's what I think. No, this is not a knock on climate or Kansas State. Kansas State is a great football team. They didn't have any letdown at all. But I watched some of this game. Kansas just didn't have any fight left. No, they, 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 they didn't, didn't want to go more because they just couldn't handle it anymore. Now you're you're right about that. That is a brutal gauntlet that they ran through, and and I you know it's almost probably would have been better if they just laid down and just got their butt whipped to one of those teams instead of pushed them to the brink. Yeah, I mean they just ran out, and that's yeah. all right. That's gonna happen sometimes. But it, Les Miles will recruit some boys, and they will provide a little more. It'll depth. take some time for him to get the depth there that he needs. Yeah. But what he's done with the talent they've got is pretty impressive. Chris Kleiman. But what, what former Kansas coach David Beatty did with that roster is absolutely criminal with all the JUCOs and everything because it you you can't maintain a roster that way. 
It's just well, impossible. Recruiting in Kansas has got to be really freaking hard, though. We got to agree with that. Oh right? yes, a hundred percent. It's tough to get guys in there um, because there's no homegrown talent. Not a knock on the state of Kansas, but high school football just doesn't seem to be the biggest place in the world in Kansas. Uh, community college football is, but that's community the problem. college. JUCO is, but most of those kids from JUCO aren't from Kansas. They're, they're no, they're not. Out. No, they're not from Kansas. No. no, not at all. All right, let's move on. Speaking of uh, of other teams that I-, I guess we could say ran out of gas, I guess Florida State gets absolutely whipped at home, and I think this is the beginning of the Toodaloo, Mister Willie Taggart train, right? Uh, Miami wins twenty seven to ten at home in Tallahassee. Florida State now four and five. Uh, Miami had nine sacks and 16 tackles for loss in this game. Sloppy play all over the place. I, I'm not even going to talk about stats. Uh, Florida State has got at Pitt, Mercer, and at... In, no, 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 I'm sorry. Excuse me. At Boston College, Alabama State, and at Florida left. So give them the Alabama State win. That puts them at five wins. You got to win at Boston College or at Florida just to make a bowl game. If they don't do that, then they are sitting at home for the second straight year after not missing a bowl for, what, 30-some-odd straight years? That's not a good look. That's not a good thing, especially after you already got rid of one offensive coordinator last year. You, you've you already gone through a whole bunch of changes as far as your coaching staff goes. Who is left to blame this on? Is there anybody? I'm, I really think this is a – Alabama had this problem – they had to bring somebody in strong enough, athletic director and head coach, to fix it. Texas had this problem, and 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 they had to bring in a guy strong enough to fix I think this is a booster problem. It might be. I think this is a people running the show problem. Because I don't know that you're going to get the quality of coach that you need to come in to clean this place up. And, and to do that, that coach is probably not going to win a lot. No, I think I think you're right. I mean, I, I I know this is gonna sound weird. I think this is a Kroom situation. Jackie Sherrill left Mississippi State in a complete cesspool. Yeah. And Coach Kroom had to come into Mississippi State and he didn't win a lot of football games. And every game he won, the head coach for the other team got fired. Yeah. But he laid a he cleaned the house and he laid a foundation for what Dan Mullins was able to take over, and then Dan was able to come in recruit, build a program, and, and lay a, a pretty strong foundation. I, I I think I think things have gotten so bad. Somebody's got to come in. They got to throw all the boosters out. They got to throw everybody out who's controlling the program and say, we're going to hire a football coach and we're going to let him run. And I don't think Willie Taggart is that guy. Oh, no. I no, I absolutely don't think Willie Taggart's that guy. Like no. it's, it, his... And here's the thing. Even if he could be that guy, he's already – compromised himself by being there during these two seasons and and not not making those drastic changes immediately. No, you're it's, right. I mean it's got to be a it's got to be a complete throw out. Now you're you're 100% right. You're 100% right on that. I I do agree with you. Um and now let's let's go ahead and jump into the recap uh not the recap but like the the roundup, I guess. We'll close out with this. We got a few games here that we're just going to talk a couple of notes on. And the first one will be Virginia and North Carolina. Now, I wasn't sure how this game was going to go because Bryce Petty has been dealing with a knee problem, and Virginia on the road has not been very good this year. But they get the win, 38-31 over North Carolina. North Carolina now sits at 4-5. and five. Uh, UNC was 0-3, or 0-3 on fourth down. Both teams were 7-13 on third down, and Virginia has one more play in them than North Carolina does, and that was uh, that was all she wrote. But North Carolina, after all this talk about Mac Brown and Coach of the Year and da 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 they are now sitting at 4-5, and five, and they've got to win two of at Pittsburgh, Mercer, and at NC State to close out. Now, give them Mercer. you got to win at Pitt or at NC State, and I don't know that they can get that done. I don't either. It wouldn't surprise me if they win one of them, but... I mean, that is some difficult stuff, man. Pitt football team looks completely different than they did before 
the Central Florida game. I mean, yeah. completely different than they did before that game. No, you you are a hundred percent right there. Um, Mississippi State fifty four, Arkansas twenty four. Mississippi State one. I had the under in this game because both teams have had trouble scoring. Mississippi State took out every little bit of frustration that they have had this season on this Arkansas football team. Did you see the picture of the Arkansas AD sitting in the locker room after the game? No, what's the, what's the guy's name? Hunter yeah. Juricic? I bet they did since one second of this game. Man, it, this the AD sitting in the locker room tells you everything that you needed to know because he looked so defeated. So, And this, this ain't a coach or anything like that. This is just the athletic director. And, oh, I mean, that's that's not a good sign when your AD is looking like that. Uh, well, they, spent, they spent a lot of money to, to, to fire Bielema and, and hire, hire Morris. Yeah, and that's, it, Jeff Long was the one who wanted to keep Bielema because of the money, because, okay, he's building a foundation here. No, they haven't gone right yet, but whatever. So the boosters just fired Jeff Long, too, and said, all right, you're out of here, so we're going to bring in somebody else. But in the meantime, here's... Here's who our coach is going to be. And it has not gone well. Mississippi State had 640 total yards, 460 yards rushing. Like, Kylan Hill had 21 carries for 234 yards and three touchdowns. That is absurd. Everybody on that staff at Arkansas should be fired for that performance. That is j- Tennessee held this Mississippi State team to 10 points. And like 200 something yards. And Arkansas at home gives up almost 700 total yards. That is, that's inexcusable. John Chavis has been an SEC icon on defense for years and years. And this ain't it. This no, ain't. This has never happened before. No, no. This was unbelievable to watch. Uh, next up, let's talk about Auburn 20, Ole Miss 14. Auburn. This, this game should have been a worse score. Auburn had 507 total yards to Ole Miss's 266. Uh, it wasn't turnovers or anything. It was just the way that the game went. It was just a, a weird flow. Nothing about this felt right. I, I went back and watched a, a, a little bit of this overnight last night. And thank God for the, uh, for the extra hour, by the way. <laughs> so the, the daylight savings time helped me get a, get a little eye on... Uh, on some of these games. But yeah, this this was surprising because Auburn, it felt like moved the football almost at will and could not score, which is exactly what LSU did against Auburn the week before. Right? Just could not score. Yeah. Um, so I did win that bet. That made me feel good. But I don't know that Ole Miss is in a better position now than they were, you know, before the bye week or anything like that. They're, they're just, Ole Miss is not a really good football team. But this does keep Auburn at 7-2, and two, and it sets up, you know, for a big matchup with Georgia. So, we'll see exactly what uh, what happens with that. Uh, last two games, I'm going to talk really quick about this one. Tennessee 30, UAB 7. UAB had four turnovers. That was the difference in this ball game because total yardage, Tennessee only had 302 total yards to UAB's 237. UAB really could have stayed in this ball game had they not turned the football over. I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, props to Jarrett Guarantano as he likes to be called now, for breaking his hand early in the week in practice, he had screws put in and still played in the ballgame. Now, I'm not going to give him like a super pass on this because, you know, if you're the coaching staff and he's not performing, you got to get him out of there. But I don't know what it says about their depth at quarterback either because, I mean, the guy's got screws in his hand. So I think that's what it says about the depth of the quarterback. Yeah. And then finally, to wrap things up, I know that you want to talk about this one Purdue, 31, Nebraska, 27. Purdue had 449 yards of total offense to Nebraska's 375. Purdue also had two turnovers to Nebraska's one. Nebraska now sits at 4-5 and five with Wisconsin at Maryland and Iowa left to go. They've got to win two of them to get to bowl eligibility. I don't they're think they're going to They're not get going bowling if people pick this damn team to go to the national championship game and win it. Anybody, anybody who openly, publicly said this team should be considered for the playoffs before the season started, A, this is every reason why you should have zero preseason rankings because you think you know these teams. You don't. You don't. 
Yeah. Everybody who watched this team and knows anything about how football is played and these teams are made up could tell you this team wasn't going to the playoffs. They weren't going to come close in the Big Ten. And now they're not even going to go bowling. That is remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. All right, that's going to wrap up the show for college hey, football. Hold on. We- I, want, I want two things I want to bring on. Bring right, on. You didn't go touch ahead. on. We talked about Tennessee and, and, and we talked about some bad games. But you were on a roll there talking about running backs. You left out one running back who had a hell of a day also. Not Chuba Hubbard good, but pretty damn good. A.J. Dillon, about? B.C. against North uh, against Syracuse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 35 right. touches, 242 yards. We had three running backs last night, yesterday, hit for plus 200 in a game. Yeah. No, That's you're right. crazy. That's crazy. B.C. with a big win. And then on top of that, I want to talk about DTR and UCLA. Listen, this Chip Kelly team is totally different than the one that started the season. And when DTR is healthy, that offense looks good. I'm, I'm going to tell you, is there a shot? Can they go into Utah and just keep it close? And that'd be interesting. I mean, if they were because to get if, that upset. If they go into Utah and keep it close. You remember, they, you remember Chip Kelly did this last year. Right they, where it, they it, then they then are the Pac-12 if they can continue on they are they will be the Pac-12 South representative which is absolutely we were wanting to bury crazy. this guy and fire him three four weeks into the season that's it. he he's got to stop starting out the year so poorly I Good think gracious. they will. I think they will I think I think it's just taken a year and a half to fix what more or less there yeah because he, I mean, he had to I get rid of a lot of guys one of those things where I could do it in a year I mean it's like an eighteen month process and. Dude, DTR's a special kid. He When he's healthy, he's seeing the field. He's got athletic ability. He's got an arm with a laser. He's not always the most accurate, but, man, he he is fun to watch, and uh, and they are rolling. So I wanted to throw those two tidbits on there if you didn't have them in the list of, of what we were talking about. So I, I sure didn't because I was trying to watch games. I was I was trying to you get the – You talked a lot about stuff. SEC teams that didn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's okay. So. That's all right. That, uh, that will close out, though, for us. Uh, we kept it under an hour, so that's definitely good. Of course, you can always get our recaps, our previews, our picks, etc. over on the YouTube page. If you're watching on there, hit subscribe. Leave a, leave a comment. Hit that like button. Share the show out. Tell your buddies about it. Subscribe on the podcast. You can find everything over at winningcureseverything.com. The show, always brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. Go check them out over at tunicatravel.com. And we will talk to you again tomorrow checking out winning cures everything if you want to keep up with us hit subscribe on youtube or your favorite podcast app visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on facebook or follow us at winning cures at gary wce or at chris b giannini on twitter share out the show leave a nice review and make sure to comment and tweet at us